actually see the participants. I understand it's a bit weird compared to normal Zooms, but because this is a WebEx events platform, the participants are automatically camera off and muted. So they'll be putting their questions in the chat and I will pose them. Um, okay, so I will give us a go then. So hi everyone, and thanks so much for joining us today. This is the Women and Gender and Diplomacy panel, and it's the last panel of the day of our annual student conference on diplomacy, which has been organised by the Young Diplomat Society at the College of Europe, which I'm a member of. I'm super delighted to be here today with our fantastic panellists. And just to give you a very brief introduction before I give the floor to them, because I know that's what you're all here for. But diplomacy is, and if you're in IRD, you'll know it's an evolving practice. And gender and topics such as women's rights have become more and more pertinent. And I think the purpose of today's panel is to discuss what role gender has to play in diplomacy. So we firstly have Dr. Jennifer Cassidy, and I'll call you Jennifer from now on, but yeah. <laughs> who is a lecturer in global governance and diplomacy at the University of Oxford. She specialised in digital diplomacy, social media, and of course, the role of gender in diplomacy. And she actually edited a volume or the first volume on gender and diplomacy theory and practice in 2017 which provides a detailed discussion of the role of women in diplomacy, both in a current and historical perspective. And she also has a wealth of diplomatic experience outside the world of academia. And then we have Evelyn Regner, who is a member of the European Parliament from Austria as part and part of the wider Socialist and Democrats group. She is the chair of the Women's Rights and Gender Equality Committee within the Parliament, which explores the kind of cross cutting role of gender from the digital world to the COVID-19 recovery and from what I saw earlier, most recently has called upon the EAS, for instance, to and other European agencies to systematically integrate gender mainstreaming and intersectional perspectives into the EU's foreign and security policy. So I think we've got a really great range of speakers here to look at the both practitioner side and academic side of gender today. And with that, I will shut up and give the role to Jennifer firstly. Um, thank you so much for um, that introduction and, um, and thank you for inviting me uh, to this, this wonderful conference uh, to speak. It's my pleasure uh, to be able to um, speak to you all on, on this topic that I'm you know, extremely um, passionate about. I thought what I would do, um, as, as I've uh, become aware that many are studying uh, not only diplomacy and going on to become practitioners, but also studying gender and diplomacy uh, specifically, which can I just say is brilliant. I created the gender and diplomacy course in Oxford for, and it was the first one created last year. And yeah, it was a push to get that past the board, can I just say, and I know this being recorded, so I don't even mind saying that. Um, so um, I just thought I'd, uh, yeah, as, as mentioned, I, I used, uh, used to be in the diplomatic sphere. I served for uh, organized mission to the UN in New York, uh, quite, a, quite a contentious seat to, see, to sit in the General Assembly, Iran, Iraq, Ireland, Israel. So that was quite a fun, well, I wouldn't say fun, but um, enlightening time. Then I also worked for the European Diplomatic Service in the Kingdom of Cambodia, working on the Khmer Rouge tribunals um, for two or three days a week. And the rest I'd work on human rights and development issues within the, within the region, primarily economic land concessions. And then I was posted back to headquarters when Ireland had the chairmanship of the OSCE 2012 and the Council of the European Union for 2013. Um, and after that, I decided diplomacy was not for me because many a time I was tempted in the General Assembly to, <laughs> to press the, I've told my colleagues this in foreign affairs who I get on with well, but press the button in the General Assembly and be like, Ireland disagrees to change foreign policy on the spot. I never did that, by the way, but I realized diplomacy was not for me. <laughs> um, I was, I needed, I couldn't be that restrained. So I had done my master's at Oxford and, and I came back um, and I actually 
not many people it was mentioned, but actually my specialty is technology and diplomacy. My PhD is on uh, how diplomats use social media during times of political crisis, which leads me to how I got focused. And I was always my, my master dissertation was relating to gender, but how I got focused really on this on the on and very and really passionate on the academic side of gender and diplomacy. So uh, I was. One weekend I was tired of uh, re uh, reading about tech and diplomacy. And so I thought I'd do some light reading on gender and diplomacy. And so I thought like I would do like any good academic does. And I just started Googling. And the only, this is in 2014, 13, 14, the, uh, the, the top three uh, to come up, top, top three lists to come up were diplomatic wives, um, the the lives and no, diplomatic the the lives and times of diplomatic wives, diplomatic ladies, which I don't even want to know. I didn't even look into that. And the third was the diplomatic right uh, wife, the undercover world of diplomacy. So, yeah, you could see there was an issue there. So, despite my PhD being tech, I was like. I need to do something about this because I had phenomenal female ambassadors when I was working in all my postings. And thankfully, I had a really supportive supervisor. He was absolutely brilliant. And he said, well, you can do this book alongside um, the, 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 the PhD. He was like, it's going to be tough. But I was like, you know, um, it's worth it. So that's how, um, you know, it, it, it came to be. And so the book really, for me, it was the, the first yeah, edited volume of, of Gender and Diplomacy, and it has a number of, of the diverse voices in it. It's the head of UN Women, um, the executive director, who's still the executive director. She has written a chapter, Mary Robinson, uh, Samantha Power. You, I couldn't believe that people were just saying yes. I was just emailing them and they were like, yeah. And I was like, okay, <laughs> you know, shocked. Thank you. And but I, my aim was to bring together the narrative and, and the voices of the women, the phenomenal women in diplomacy that I have worked with that were not diplomatic wives. And this is nothing. This is not critiquing diplomatic wives, but it's saying the story of women in diplomacy should not be the primary one, should not be about diplomatic wives. And so the three main aims of the book and I and uh, I, I, why I'm focusing on the book now, even though I wouldn't even, I would say to people, there's more updated versions of this, but I, in my articles that I, I write, I still keep these three tenants. So the first was, and is in my work to expose and confront the gender of diplomacy. So although the book is t titled Gender and Diplomacy, because of my first book and I didn't know how to negotiate, I was just like, yeah, of course, you, you, that's, that's, that's fine. Um, but I wanted to call it the gender of diplomacy. And I still to this day call it the gender of diplomacy. And by this, I mean, you know, it's not gender with diplomacy, gender versus diplomacy, it's the gender of diplomacy. And, by, and what this I mean is by viewing diplomacy through the lens of gender, it doesn't take the participation of men in diplomacy for granted. So it's not an us against them. Rather, it seeks to interrogate how masculine norms and values have shaped the diplomatic realm and shaped the diplomatic sphere today. So it really takes away from this, you know, it's a uh, you know, men versus women, or this notion of, of gender, or women can only ascribe to certain gender discourses, and men can only ascribe to certain discourses. It doesn't take participation of men for granted. We're just looking at how masculine norms and values have shaped the diplomatic sphere um, to this day. And it's clear, like, I don't think I need to go in uh, into much depth <laughs> to, to to see that um that, that this certainly um has 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 been the case and you know by by um looking at this as an easy tool for policymakers and 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 um and academics and practitioners um to then use um the second 
the second um, core aim was to uh, was to shed light on the historical challenges that women have faced within the diplomatic realm, which have never which had never been highlighted. Bear in mind, this was the first book. It's not like I was just rehashing something. Um, and I thought this was really important because by examining the historical and institutional scarcity of female diplomats through a gender lens, it becomes clear that diplomacy has been and is, as I mentioned, decidedly, decidedly masculine. And when asked about her views on a career, a, a woman's career in politics, Nancy Pelosi, as we know, as the first 52nd Speaker of the House of uh, Representatives, or maybe 53rd now, but uh, the, and the first female um, speaker, she, when she was asked this question, what, what do you think about a woman's career in politics? She replied quite bluntly, and I would agree, it is not for the faint of heart. And, you know, if I even think it's not for the faint of heart, I can't imagine what, what you know, she has, has, has gone through, through, you know, to get to, to, to get to where she is. Um, but over centuries, I think this is important to know just for anyone studying diplomacy, whether you're studying uh, gender and diplomacy or, or or not, and you're just studying diplomacy in general. I'm sure you've all heard of Harold Nicholson. Prepare for, I hopefully, I say prepare never to like him again. I hope you don't like him again after this quote. Like he does make some good points just to say on diplomacy in general. But this is quite a shocking quote that I found, and and and, and um, obviously I backed it up and and before included in the book. But um, you know, noted diplomats from um, Machiavelli to Harold Nicholson have long preached that women have no place in in diplomacy, and Harold Nicholson himself said, and I quote, it's etched into my brain, <laughs> quote, women have women are prone to the qualities of zeal sympathy and intuition which unless kept under the firmest control can be dangerous qualities in international affairs i did not freeze i'm just giving taking a moment that is oh harold like oh harold like no this i can't but he is considered you know one of the godfathers of diplomatic thought so we we, w w the point I'm getting across here on this is, w and this goes not just for diplomacy, it goes for international relations. I say to my students, you can know, read every single diplomatic book. You can read every single international relations book that is set on this reading list, set on this. But we need to remember that the people who've made it to this reading list usually are from the top, top colleges. They're pro most likely from older generations, and they are from one school of thought. That's not saying that they and and it, and if it's in English, well, this is in certainly in my in, in in my university. If it's in English, like we are, you know, completely removing a huge portion of of, of literature that we that we don't discuss. So you know, it it is this thing of like you should always question what you're reading just because you know exactly what's right in the exam doesn't mean it's exactly you might be answering the question right doesn't mean it's you know technically the right answer um but yeah moving on from that the third and the final uh the final uh, tenant or contribution was to examine the current conditions and, and the current obstacles that we're in face and which which are many um and within the diplomatic within the diplomatic sphere and two two chapters i will just highlight here which i think are extremely interesting one is by Anne Towns and Brigitte Nicholson and they wrote within the book a, a fascinating chapter and where they quantitatively mapped 9000 female ambassadors from the top 40 OECD countries and what they found was at the moment at the time of writing, there was 16% on average female ambassadors around the world. And let's just say that's amazing. Let's just say like, wow, that is, we are amazing for having 16%, which is to not, but let's just for hypothetical sake. 
when you look at where those 16,000 are placed, they are not getting overwhelmed, like overwhelmingly, this is not just like a small thing of a, within, the, within the statistics. They are not getting New York, they are not getting Geneva, they are not getting Paris, they are not getting Brussels, they are not getting Beijing, they are not getting the power postings. And so, although we're seeing a rise in female um, diplomats, we need to, the question that I have now changed is not how many women are there, but also where are the women? Now, when I presented this to um, my uh, Department of Foreign Affairs, Ireland, who you know, I get on extreme, ex extremely well with, um, still, I, I said this to them and they replied to me, oh, but Jennifer, you know, we've had a female ambassador to Washington, New York, Brussels, um, Geneva, Paris, and I, to which I replied, yeah, it was, but it was the same woman. Like, it does not count if it is the same woman being rotated around all the postings. Like, that's not um thing. And the other interesting study they found, it was fit, they did a study of 15,000 junior diplomats. So it's not just the top, because we regularly think, okay, it's 50-50, you know, when they come in. But in violent and war-torn regions, women are less likely to be posted to these regions. Now, I have to make the caveat that women are less likely to put themselves forward for this also. Um, so it's not just people not picking them. We can go into a whole host of why they don't put themselves forward, but it's not just a panelist of people saying, I'm not picking women to, to go. Like that simply the choice isn't there. Women do be select themselves out of the process. Now there's a more like myriad of reasons for that, but for another day. But what, why, as I say to my students, <laughs> who cares? Why does it matter? Why are you telling me this? That's what I actually do say to my students. But um, it matters because in diplomacy and most ministries of foreign affairs, these postings in, in quote, violent or war-torn regions are seen as promotion postings. So if women don't have them at a junior level, they're already off to, um, um, you know, they're already off or like uh, uh, at the back foot. And so I could go on, but I will end with, <laughs> I will end with um, uh, this chapter, the chapter, no, thank you. Sorry, you're not gonna be subjected to a chapter. Um, I realize I, I can't see the people and I'm just yeah, speaking as if in my living, fireside chats, FDR. But um, so there's this um, paragraph in the book that the editors asked me to take out, but I had written this when I thought Hillary, no, I had not. I had written the introduction of the book when I thought Hillary Clinton would win the election and when I thought Helen Clark would become the Secretary General. Um, now, of course, I realize there's an echo chamber and all this stuff. I've become wiser, but also just a note to anyone, if you're writing a book and there's international events, do not write the introduction before the international events have played. Like, it seems an obvious point, but just to drive that home but so i was quite in a you know a stern state uh, when i was writing rewriting the introduction and they said to take out this chapter because it wasn't academic and it seemed too too angry but i don't think it is but i, I will read it and then end with that so i said it says with that said, this book does not attempt to advocate for the mandatory involvement of women in the, in the diplomatic sphere. It is not meant to serve as a persuasive tool, as there is no necessity for persuasion. By all measures, we are on a steady path towards non-gender diplomacy, despite various obstacles which persist to this day. These played a wide-ranging prohibited role, which spans everything from a complete absence of female participation in some countries to virtually every scenario in between. Now, while eliminating these obstacles is one way towards achieving equal involvement and representation of women in the diplomatic sphere, such a strategy would depend largely on the open-mindedness of men by whom the barriers were set up in the first place. This volume does not represent a form of appeal to those who would 
prefer a state of perpetual isolation of women from diplomacy. Rather, it attempts to bring to the mainstream the often downplayed and underreported role of women in governance and policy making. And more importantly, it strives to showcase, and I think this is the key word, the inevitability the inevitability of increased female representation in the realm of diplomacy, despite deep seated doubt, resentment, sexism, and misogyny. The ending is a little harsh, <laughs> but it was a moment for me. Um, but yes, that I will end it there. As you can tell, I could go on for quite a while. But um, thank you all, the faces I can't see, but thank you all for listening. Um, and yes. That's amazing. Thank you so much. That was so interesting. And I don't think it was too angry at all. Sometimes it's what you need to hear. <laughs> okay, well, I'll pass to Evelyn Regner now and go ahead. Uh, good evening again, Lucy, Jennifer, and of course, to all listening right now and participating. So I'm looking already right now uh, very much forward to, to, to having this uh, debate afterwards. So, um, uh, thanks for introducing me. Yes, I'm Evelyn uh, from Austria, from Vienna, a lawyer there in the European Parliament, uh, chairing the Gender Equality uh, Committee, and uh, above all, being very busy uh, in financial and tax issues. So, I think feminist economy is something very important in order to uh, shape the society, in order to change it. And there, I'm just uh, 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 digging in uh, into the issue representation matters because it shapes it shapes finally our society it shapes foreign policy as well and therefore the question of representation um who is doing what in which post in which position which we uh, which uh responsibilities of utmost importance so i was uh, very happy and proud uh that's now it's almost uh, more than two weeks ago uh, to have uh, for the for the 8th of March, the International Women's Day, uh, Kamala Harris and Jennifer Ardern uh, in, the Euro in the European Parliament. So when uh, we were debating and I proposed that, it, it, everybody said, oh no, you never will get them. And I just said, no, uh, I think there's also something very typical sometimes to be so modest. No, we want the most fantastic, the most, the, the, the best speakers, the best idols we could have. And I think Jacinda Ardern from New Zealand uh, and uh, Kamala Harris were really excellent because what's happening right now, COVID, um, terrible effects, especially on young women. So we have fact figures, there are so many things happening, unemployment, uh, violence rising up. And according to the first studies we have from IG, the international, uh, the, uh, not the international, the European Institute for Gender Equality, it's above all well qualified women, young women, the young women who are the first who are suffering. Why? For young people, anyway, it's difficult to enter into the job market, to have the accession to those fantastic jobs. And to be a woman isn't an, an advantage, so, so watch out. And therefore, it was ex excellent what Jennifer did right now, to be angry. Anger is a good basis of really pushing to change the situation. And in these times where we have on the one side huge backlash and on the other side, thank God, young women and men being angry, that is a good uh, uh, way also to, to push for uh, another foreign policy. We had... Um, uh, uh, this week, uh, the, I mean, it's, it's already lasting a little bit longer, but, uh, um, the, um, the CSW, so the delegation this week year to the committee on the status of women in New York in took place, uh, 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 uh in real, uh, times, but, uh, in a digital way. And, uh, that meant, uh, that we had, a. Uh, Delegation, I was chairing there, and many uh, female members of the European Parliament, excellent uh, men as well. And then, and therefore, I mention it right now and, and coming to the issue of course, uh, the negotiations on the conclusions on gender equality. We really don't need any more some uh, uh, gender balance for the 60. We have to go for gender equity. Yeah. And who was leading these no negotiations? I mean, we were just Joking when I talked to you and uh, to the uh, ambassador of the European Union to uh, the United Nations. Of course, it is a male ambassador. Of course, uh, the negotiation team 
deep when negotiating the whole text for the conclusions was uh, a male diplomat. And afterwards, when we're just talking about the conclusions, what has to be there, it's on the agenda of the European Union. It's integral part of European Union's foreign policy to promote gender equality. And when those who are negotiating and pushing the issue for the conclusions on side of the European Union, again, are men, it uh, is not the, uh, I would say, it's not the excellent uh, picture we are just uh, giving to the outside world. And therefore, in the European Union's foreign policy, we uh, uh, managed um, to push uh, 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 Pepe Borrell, so our, 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 uh, I, I always say our so-called uh, foreign minister of the European Union, because otherwise it's getting too complicated, uh, really to push uh, the gender equality issue, not only to promote it outside, which is very important, but also to live it within. And uh, when he had the hearing, when we had him in the hearing to uh, be elected, um, he uh, just did an excellent explanation what he will do in order to do gen gender mainstreaming, in order to push at all levels, at really all levels, also on the top levels, medium level, and whatever, uh, in the in the, uh, in the external service uh, women. And of course, you all know that, that we're lacking behind. So monitoring and really implementation, that's uh, the, the major issue uh, in this field. And uh, Jutta Urpilainen is also the one who is really uh, going for some instruments uh, in order to push it to improve the situation. So somehow we know the Euro uh, European Union has the obligation to do the politics and also to do it internally, and still we are uh, uh, missing there the right steps. Two days ago, and therefore the question is always, what can we do in order to improve the situation? We decided um, with the uh, Vice President of the European Parliament, uh, a gender action plan that should be applied within the European Parliament, and we're in close contact with the Commission because uh, this should go hand in hand. So the question is right now, which measures to set in order really to enable women and men going on? And this is really a very, uh, a very, uh, a very tricky field because it's not always one measure. It's it's just a whole mosaic of uh, uh, of obstacles that women are uh, taken away of uh, getting the positions in lead. I'm just looking down right now because I would like to give you some data I was picking up. You might know, but maybe not. Only 15% of the worldwide ambassadors are women. Numbers from 2017 show that the whole world had only 15 female defense ministers. Out of the 47 Council of Europe members, only five have female foreign ministers. And within uh, the United Nations up to March 2018, no woman ever had the Department of Politi Political Affairs. Uh, we have in the European Parliament uh, a little bit less uh, members uh, being women since uh, the uh, Brexit had taken place. So we are not almost 40 percent, not, uh, not, not, not really reached, but almost. And at February uh, 2019, women represented uh, 39 percent of all managers in the European Commission. So still a way to go. We know the five C's are the obstacles, confidence, candidate, culture, cash, and childcare. So um, confidence, that is always the question, who is taking, uh, uh, taking uh, really the possibilities when they are given? Women sometimes tend to uh, look when there are 10 criteria and they have nine and a half not to apply because there is a little bit missing. Men are just pushing and uh, going ahead also in foreign, when, when it's about those jobs mentioned in, uh, in, 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 uh, um, in foreign uh, policy. Candidate selection, uh, also it's the same. It's not, sometimes we, you, you just can't compare it. It's, it's the same in politics uh, as it is in enterprises, as it is in, uh, also in foreign ministries. So, um, we still have these old boys networks that are existing forever and forever. And uh, this also has to do with culture. Who is sitting there on the table? Who is negotiating? What is the, uh, what is the style? And this has to do 
uh, within the system in order to get the jobs. And then when you are already at the job and you are sitting there at the, negotiate, the negotiation table, uh, what are the obstacles that hinder you uh, to really put the issues on the table when you are so uh, underrepresented? Cash, that's for the for the uh, companies <laughs> or also for political jobs. So that's not for the foreign ministries, but uh, it means normally it's for women far more difficult to get uh, to get the, the 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 support when they're running in politics or to get the the money when they're going to the banks in order to. Uh, run a business and finally up childcare. I'm just mentioning that too because this is also an argument in in uh, foreign uh, uh, in foreign politics because to manage all that this is also really a question which is not easy. We just have studies. Uh, I'm referring right now to women put, being pushed in top position in different fields such as bank and the top of the banks or uh, in the top of. Uh, Political areas like Mayas in Austria found out there are more um, there are more Mayas whose first name is Josef, just one name, Joseph, than all female mayors together. Imagine that we were just referring to little cities and we're just counting them, and then you just see when uh, digging deeper, what is the obstacle? I mean, it's all this. It's that. Uh, do you want always to 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 go in for this uh, working style to hang out in the evening and have an additional whatever whiskey somewhere in a veranda? I mean, there are different cultures, different styles. Couldn't it be also possible in another way? I had an excellent minister with whom I was working, and she was she was saying when she was doing some negotiations, and this applies to foreign policy, this applies to uh, social policy, this applies to all sort of work. She said. We there have right now deadly important negotiations. They are absolutely important. We have to come to a conclusion. I'm leading that. I just tell you, we take point one, two, three from the agenda between nine and twelve. If, if you don't find a solution, we don't have any solution. So in order to to stop all that rubbish uh, uh, in negotiations, which also applies to peace negotiations and whatever negotiations in foreign policy, that you always end up at midnight and then you just have these funny games with the with the clock then we say no in order to keep the data we just stop the clock but we're sitting until three o'clock and four o'clock in the morning i'm so fed up with that because i had it so many times and then you go out at three o'clock and four o'clock in the morning and the journalists are waiting uh in front of the door and you just can show the journalists we are, we are negotiating until early morning because we are fighting like hell for the for the sake of uh, uh, better solutions, be peace, be it, uh, 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 be trade policy, be it whatever. No, you just can't do that in another way. And this is a question of culture. And uh, it turned out with uh, those uh, with those uh, teams negotiating heavily important issues in politics and foreign politics. It turns out you can do that also when you organize uh, the whole teams in a different way. And therefore, I say it. Uh, it shapes the policy. Who is sitting there on the table? Diversity is of utmost importance. It's important for peace negotiations. It's in, uh, to uh, to have their mixed teams. It's also uh, having a wider spectrum of what issues you take on the table. Today in the afternoon there was uh, uh, a debate at the OECD, and I just would like to give you this picture um, of the title. It was on taxes, but I don't refer to tax policy. To be gender blind doesn't mean to be gender neutral. And therefore, it is so important that on the top in foreign politics, there are as well women represented uh, the way they should be, especially in the European Union, where it is our mantra that is uh, one uh, of the heart, it's the heart of the foreign policy of the European Union uh, to support women, to support. Uh, uh, in order to go for sustainability, so really to support women with uh, microcredits, with uh, uh, training, with sexual education, with all these things that are so important when you really go into foreign politics. I would like to end up right now my uh, introduction with a good example, because I think it's always good to uh, have uh, uh, good examples. Uh, Sweden presented in 2014 the first feminist uh, foreign agenda. Women's rights 
human security and equal representation are the core elements in it. And it supports the establishment of peace ministries to demonstrate that peace is as important foreign policy as defense already is. And I think uh, uh, this is uh, something excellent. Also, the, uh, the, the joint first ever uh, Women Foreign Ministers Conference 2018 uh, of the EU and Canada. So I think all this gives uh, uh, an image how the inclusion of strong women could shape also the content of foreign policy. And of course, therefore, we have to push with quota and with uh, funding and training and networks. Amazing. Thank you so much. Um, that was a really interesting intervention and to hear it from your side as a chair of the committee as well. And I think I was going to start the Q&A, but we already have some questions, uh, one for each of you, which works out lovely. So uh, for, oh, we've got loads of questions now. <laughs> for, um, for Jennifer, firstly, um, Roberta asked, um, you mentioned that women don't put themselves forward for postings. What is the main reason for this? Yeah, I know you said you can get into it, but maybe just a brief overview. Um, I think you're muted. Sorry. Uh, yeah, just to make the biggest caveat, this is not all women, um, but not all women <laughs> deselect themselves out of the process that I am in no way saying, saying that at, at all. But I myself have deselected myself out of out of many processes. Um, I just know that speaking from from my experiences, but from my study and my research and interviewing uh, diplomats who have actively deselected themselves out of um, the process for um, violent and war torn regions, which this chapter that I'm referring to in the study. Um, well, the first is just an overarching kind of. Uh, somewhat of a cliche, but f f uh, framing mantra. You can't be what you can't see. There, we don't see it yet. There's not that many examples of, of women um, in, in, in the in these regions, particularly um, in the foreign ministries that I interviewed. Um, so that's just an overarching kind of like conceptual framework. But another trend um, of people not putting themselves forward is and I and I think um, it, it ties directly to the point on um, you know child care the work life balance. Um, I uh, these postings are not at uh, 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 and again it ties to my the gender of diplomacy. The whole institution of diplomacy was created for men by men, and it has not caught, yes, we may have caught up in numbers, in entry numbers, 50-50, but we have not dealt with things like childcare, work-life balance, um, and, you know, turning the burden of burden of representation, like should now shift from, from, from you know, women having to do that to, to men actively, you know, changing the um, issues, because particularly in these regions, you know, if 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 a woman uh, if a if a woman has a, a family, and this is all this is, and I'm not like musing here. This is from like interviews and data, by the way. You know, uh, it makes perfect sense of, of why you know. I'll think twice if we're going to put down Afghanistan. You, you know, and and if the institutional constructs are not there in the embassy, in order to. Uh, enable that and and for these pe and these families to feel protected then you know uh, it makes it makes sense why women might deselect themselves you know out of the, out of the process but but on that same and i think a point, uh, um evan made an extremely important point as well this is no different from politics from business like this happens all the time um and, and just one example be, being from a personal, so the job that I hold now, uh, the lecture in global governance and diplomacy here, they have never hired a woman, they never hired a woman in 14 years since it it was created. Um, and when the job came up and I didn't go first because I was like, well, I've never seen a woman hard, I don't think, and I realize it's being recorded and I don't mind saying it. 
um I, you know i i why i have i already had a job teaching ppe at oxford why would i put myself through this because i know i'm qualified for the job and i'm just going to lead myself to disappointment um so i deselected myself out of the process but what happened then was they the candidates that they had they weren't satisfied with and then they came to me and said, would I apply? And then they did it again. They did another app, 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 application. But like, had they been satisfied with the people that they wanted, this other person would have got the job. And I actively, I like, I sat down, thought about it. Will I go for this? I knew I was fully qualified. I'd done the master's course myself. wouldn't be a technical conference, well, a WebEx conference without any technical issues, would it? Um, okay. We'll give her five minutes to come back. Is this, is this? Okay. There we go, you're back. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, I just went, sorry, I just went on to uh, 4G, but yeah, I'll just end it there saying, Um, we can't hear you, Jennifer. I'm not sure why. Um, it might be easier if you, in terms of like the WebEx connection, maybe if you turn the camera off and then just use the mic. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Just for the time being, and we can try it again in the next question. Yeah, can you hear me now? Or perfect. Yeah, hear you yeah. perfectly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, we were just to end with I don't know how much you heard. Okay. Um there seems to be some sort of connection issue. I'm not sure why. Um what we might do, Jennifer, is give you a minute and then um, I'll ask Evelyn one of the questions and then we can come back for you finishing point and then ask another question that's been put in the chat if that's okay. Yeah. I know you can Maybe if you want to yeah. disconnect and reconnect it might help. I'm not yeah. Sure. yeah. Okay. If, give me a message if you need any help anyway. So yeah. <laughs> okay well I'll turn to you Evelyn and um, sorry. Um, so someone has asked, Doris has asked, does the requirement to have geographical balance and political balance in EU leadership and administration lead to less prioritization of gender balance? Should not. I mean, there are excellent women everywhere and excellent men. So, I mean, that shouldn't be an argument. Of course, we have to respect geography. Of course, we have these elements in. But uh, what what we did right now with this gender action plan in the um, in the in the European Parliament is wherever there is an option to say, okay, uh, let's have candidates, a candidate, a female and a male candidate. What we are lacking, why we why the situation sometimes looks so terrible uh, in the European Union is that most of the times it's member states nominating. So and the member states. If they're all nominating a man for this post and then a man from that post and we just have men. So somehow, sometimes it's also very difficult for uh, the European Commission then to uh, look to, uh, even if they say, okay, we need more women, um, that the nominations don't reflect that. And therefore, uh, this whole nomination policy should go more in the direction that uh, that uh, both a man or a woman are uh, proposed, or it depends on so on the post. If it's possible that, uh, I mean that that there has that's not always necessary that there is a competition then directly or whatever. You just have to look um, how many people should be sent to one uh, to to one place. And therefore, I mean when you when you talk to Borel and to uh, Urpilainen. They say we are so sorry. Would be we would like to be far more stricter, but we can't because we, uh, the nominations come from the from from the member states, and therefore I am working more and more uh, on 
uh, procedures where we start far earlier. So I'm not so specialized in all foreign politics nominations here. And that's not my thing, but I know very well how it's working at European Central Bank, at European Banking Authority, at the European, uh, uh, at the IOPA, and all these uh, money uh, institutions, which are of utmost importance, because where when the European investment in, uh, decides on who's getting a credit and who's, which project doesn't get a credit, finally you shape always foreign policy as well. You shape everything when you have the hand on the money, and therefore it's so important that we have uh, more balance everywhere. Not because men are bad and women uh, don't pretend to be, uh, I don't know, full of empathy and all that, that's rubbish. So uh, we're all human beings, but we have to, to have the whole picture, the whole way of thinking. And here, of course, childcare is included in everyday life and uh, practical questions and everything. And so we need as much diversity as possible. I mean, also for foreign politics, it doesn't only mean men and women. And how, how is it for women in foreign politics? It also means, are there always uh, the former as aristocratic kids who now become diplomats, or do we have also foreign policy that enables people from uh, with a social background where you haven't expected that uh, that they are doing the way as a foreign uh, in the foreign policy in order to 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 do foreign politics that really covers everybody? And of course, there is also the question of uh, of of, uh, uh, of ethnic background if you're. I mean, our society is full of colors and has a lot of people. And we just look who is representing us. I mean, this is really like a, a special cast. And how can you how can you uh, uh, shape then policies when it's always the same little group of people who's doing that for generations? And therefore, uh, what we are doing with this gender action plan is trying to 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 demand to put all those demands in that at least the European Union does better. And here we can really control and always uh, uh, and always try to, uh, to, to advance. I don't know if this really uh, uh, was, a, was an appropriate answer. I simply, I simply tried it this way. No, I think that was great. And uh, welcome back, Jennifer. I hope that's all the technical, diff well, technical bingo is done. So like, um, yeah, so I'll maybe ask the next question because it's to both of you and Jennifer you can feel free to finish off your point as well but um where is it it's from Annalise who says um do you believe that most country more countries the last country being Spain will announce will announce the implementation of a feminist foreign policy so I know that um Sweden for instance kind of spearheaded that so feel free to discuss <laughs> well is the question the last because I only think, yeah, um, I think there's only been a handful of countries that have announced it. Yeah, I think perhaps maybe. So, do you believe that implementing such a policy will advance the position of women within diplomacy? So maybe um, we can chat a bit about so it instead. Yeah. So, well, I, <laughs> to, to 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 give the caveats, I'm on the advisory council for the Centre for Feminist Foreign Policy. <laughs> Um, and I gave a TED talk on why we need a feminist foreign policy. So hands up on it. That was in 2000 and just after Sweden announced it. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll, that, I'll just get to show my stripes there. I think where it stands. Um, yes, I do think, I think that the three, even though Sweden, um, you know, was, was the maker of it, we must not fall into the, the the trap and the critique that what when people are saying, oh, it's an implementation of a Western ideal on foreign policy. That is not what a feminist foreign policy is. A feminist foreign policy is that nation state policy <laughs> being crafted and being constructed the way it would always have done However, they have these three R's, um, try and say it in the, not the Irish way, the R's, not ORs, R's. They have three R's at the center, representation, rights, and resources. That is representation of women in all aspects of policy. And one of the greatest quotes about, that I always turn to about this is, nothing about us without us. I think it's, you know, 
but that's just like a basic ask, you know, resources, that resources are given to um, to women to promote gender equality, which we know, like we fundamentally know the research shows, <laughs> creates a better, more stable society. Um, so rights and, and then just the basic fundamental human rights um, are given to women in society. And so it's not a promotion of, of, a, of a Western idea. And so of course, it is going to create a, a better, um, a more stable society. And one, I'll leave it with this is, just when the first lockdown hit, or like a, a few, uh, maybe a few months into it, Oxford asked me to give an Oxford, uh, Oxford at Home virtual talk. And they said, um, would you give it on why are women leaders so successful during the coronavirus um, pandemic? And of course, I wanted to come on and say, it's because we're great, we're amazing, like the end and shut down the laptop, like that's all you need to know. But like, I went to the research, of course, and I looked at the data. And if you look at the, the, the states that we're looking at, like um, Taiwan, New Zealand, Germany, uh, the Nordics, they, they are so different in, in so many ways. But what the research showed is, and this is not taking away from the phenomenal job that these women leaders have, have done during the coronavirus, but the variables of a stable health system, you know, gender equality, you know, respect for all, um, like all, all races, good healthcare systems, that stable society allowed these leaders to emerge. And they allowed this le these leaders to emerge and for the people to have confidence in the leaders. So when the leaders say, you know what, we need a lockdown, you know what we did, the people trusted the leader. So it is not in any way taking away from the phenomenal job these women leaders have done, but it is showing that it is a they are elected as a result of a very, very stable, concrete society, which is what a feminist foreign policy would do, not only in their foreign policy, but also reflected in their domestic. To add a little bit, exactly that's it, because it's um, also to say sometimes, and uh, I was just, when I, when I mean, lockdown, the first lockdown, when the whole thing started, it was nobody knows what's happening here. What, what is the best solution? So one can only try here a step, there a step, and ask the population to have trust. And uh, when it just looks, for example, to New Zealand, which is in the order, she said sometimes, I think I made a mistake, or I can only hope that you are trusting me. So it was not like, for example, in my country or in many other countries, when you just have a leadership who says, I show you, I know how, how it has to be done, go with me. And if something is not working, of course, many things didn't work because nobody knew what, what are all these effects. Then they always try to find somebody who is guilty, who made a mistake. Uh, and um, I, I, I like this very much also when we look to Finland, to Sanna Marin, because they have such a young leader. So. It is always and this picture, and I think, I mean, now we're not only in foreign policy, but I think we always can learn from, from each other. Uh, and it was in Norway. I think in Norway it started, and it was done in Finland by Sanna Marin as well, to make a press conference that I hate to children. And this was not a joke for publicity, but to say, look, I make a press conference with simple words, but I uh, explain you why you can't go to school. And I know this is also difficult and whatever. And this, I mean, uh, is, I mean, these are any, anyway instruments that have to be applied everywhere when, you are, when you're in decision-making, when you're doing foreign policies, when you're negotiating uh, 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 with crazy people to, uh, to be inclusive and not to try to, convince of your narrow-minded whatever picture. And therefore I liked very much those female leaders because they acted in such a different way, but uh, always as inclusive as possible. Yeah, I think you're right. I think to add to that as well, I'm Scottish and I think in the UK, you see a lot of the contrast between Nicola Sturgeon, despite current issues and Boris Johnson, she was often 
explaining the same rhetoric like I'm asking you I know it's not fun I know it's not it's like hard to ask you this but please get on board with me so I, I feel a lot in what you're saying both of you it's really interesting but um I think I'll come to there's a question for you both now from Stephanie they're two separate questions so I'll read them out and let you go to each of them so uh, for Jennifer Stephanie asks um, she's interested to know your thoughts on the EU's efforts in post promoting gender equality so Ursula von der Leyen for instance announced a union for equality as a priority of her commission and is publishing a, or has published a gender equality strategy for 2020 to 2025. And for Evelyn, uh, she's asked if you can comment on the EU and African Union cooperation on gender equality and women's rights. You know, the new Cotonou agreement negotiations have been pushed back and there's been certain EU member states on language or pushback on the language concerning non-discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation. The questions are quite long, so I think you'll be able to see them in the chat. So if you want to read them in full, go for it. And whoever wants to start. I will just say on the back of women leaders saying, I don't know at all, <laughs> that <laughs> I don't know the exact answer to this question um i'll put my hands up and say i can give an overview of of, of how, how i think the eu is doing that and and i think the Evan made it an excellent point saying you know since the uk's uh it's things have gone up and and you know Mairead McGuinness, uh the irish um our irish representative who we're very proud of um um in the uh, european commission i think the eu um is doing very well i think it, it is uh, promoting uh female representation um equality and it is certainly not something that's slipping past them in, in the slightest but providing the specific policy that was just mentioned I would be lying if I if I could speak on that because it's been a long two terms and it may have slipped past me, so I'm sorry. I can speak on that because that's my business. That's what I'm doing every day. <laughs> so, I mean, just in few in in, in few words. So, uh, uh, of course, it's great that we have the gender equality strategy of the Commission and the. Uh, um, uh, major issues in there is right now the directive on the pay transparency to fight the pension and the pay gap, absolutely important. And in short words, I can say it's a good proposal. It's really good proposal. There are some things we have to change, but it's right space so that it is a right of women. You can go to the court and you have the right to get this information once per year. And if it's a bigger enterprise, then you also have the uh, procedure, which you regard as very important that they have to do something like a reporting uh, and comparing the categories of male, female, whatever work is in there. So all in all, we can say it's good, but it still has to be improved. So that's one piece. Another piece is women on boards directive to have really female leaders in companies. Well, I'm the rapporteur. We, we are waiting for some member countries who say it's important to have uh, women in leadership in companies very important but we do that on our own at the national level and then they don't nothing so that's our uh that's our problem but here uh, uh we are pushing and i think we always have to be not patient uh, very impatient but to have a long breath and to be marathon runners and then there is a third piece i don't want to bother with you with all the uh, uh the things that are in there but are very highly exciting is uh, a violence package and this also fits with what was the question of uh, 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 of uh, the Africa strategy I mean we have in Europe the Istanbul convention which is quite simple it simply says I make it very simple there is an obligation of the state of every of all authorities to protect women against violence that means it's not something where you can say it's private, no, domestic violence. This is a task of the 
uh, of the leaders to do something against, and that means juridical action, enough uh, shelters. That means also um, a lot of uh, fighting against stereotypes by uh, uh, education. So there's a lot of work, not only to punish and protect, but to do that already beforehand. And uh, when the Istanbul Convention can't be implemented, because as we know already right now, Turkey, others, I mean, that's right now, European, not European Union, of course, but uh, others uh, don't want it to present a strategy how to protect women, not only against femicides, but also against cyber uh, violence, harassment, everything what is uh, hate speech online. There is a lot of tools we can do, and that's all in there. It's all very important. i just tell you one thing. We're living in times where we have uh, men and women who want work-life balance. So going on, getting more modern men as well. And on the other side, we have those backlash countries. And it's uh, it's getting tougher and tougher, and you all know that. And why I say that has to do also uh, to do with the Africa strategy, simply because uh, uh, as one of the major elements of foreign politics of the European Union is empowering women. That's it, helping them, uh, because then, of course, it has to do with the population development all over the world. If you empower women, then they don't use too much wood and whatever, uh, which is also uh, important for uh, 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 the fight against climate change to do sexual education. It's one of the peace elements uh, to, uh, to, to empower uh, young girls and women over there. And, uh, Right now, it is right. Exactly the same things happening in Turkey and in Poland slightly. It's also in a couple of African countries. So it was really shocked when I was at the ICBD conference in Nairobi. And then you have countries who who get crazy. Uh, they say uh, you can already do your uh, forced marriage um, of uh, girls at the age of 10 years or whatever, but they are not allowed to get any. Uh, education in order to know uh, how babies uh, uh, exist. So somehow there is really weird things happening. And I just can say only concerning this strategy, that's one of the major elements. And one of the major elements is uh, to uh, empower girls and women and uh, to, to, to name and shame that put that on the table. That's what we are doing in, in uh, European um, foreign politics. Otherwise, they don't get uh, the money for the for the funds. So it's always a tool uh, via funding to via the European uh, support. Great, thank you so much. Um, I guess let's move on to another question. It's from Laura and she asks something that will probably interest most of us is what advice would you both give to young women when they find themselves in a diplomatic environment or political environment? that's strongly dominated by men. Uh, I'm very quick and then let's speak very long. <laughs> Jennifer, <laughs> one is uh, uh, role models, the other is so uh, networks. I'll give, you, uh, I'll give you an example, which I really appreciate a lot. Here in uh, Brussels, uh, there is a network of um, of female ambassadors. And I think the male ambassadors, they are always envying it because that means really also um, you have more information. I mean, it's a smaller circle than all these men's circles, but it's a very efficient one. So it's an exchange. And uh, of course, when you've been uh, young in politics, you don't start as an ambassador. So uh, it's always good to go in for some really networks to create them. Just be creative and say, okay, here is a, a nice young one. There is one. And simply to, to install that in an informal way. It doesn't have to be perfect, but to, to really to go for that. The next one is uh, um, sort of, I just mentioned role models. Look around where there is uh, uh, somebody whom you, uh, where you, where you think you could have trust, somebody being in foreign politics, being already a bit more advanced and going there, having a conversation. So somehow being offensive also in the way to say, I need somebody, a mentor. And this is something, of course, that requires a little bit uh, to be courageous, uh, uh, but normally it's always worth it. And therefore, of course, when one uh, like Jennifer is the first one to
doing uh, a job that hasn't been done before, it's far, far tougher. I think we as women should give each other the hand. So, uh, 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 helping one the other uh, going further. I should say I'm probably not the best person to speak on this because I left diplomacy, but um, um, I, I left for, for for a variety of, of of reasons. One, I didn't realize Ireland was going to change as fast as it did regarding its policies, like equal marriage and uh, reproductive rights. Like we've just done a completely u like a U turn compared to when I was there and I just wasn't prepared to, you know, be in a, I never thought we'd even have a referendum that fast. So I wasn't prepared to kind of dissent my whole life. And I decided to um, um, leave and yeah, it was, it, I have to, I have to admit, it was like one of the reasons I left. I'm just being complete, completely honest. Um, but on to more positive notes, of what people can do <laughs> because and and then it is one of the reasons that i did the book and they all reflect what, what evan said um mentorships um at, i have a policy recommendation chapter at the end of it um based on what foreign ministries can do and when i consult with them um you know mentorships is is, is always a key one and this would for example help in the region of if a woman, woman was to deselect herself out of the process, you know, a mentor might be like, no, you're able for this. Like you, you, you put your name for it, you, you can do this. Um, the second, um, again, it's reflective of what Evelyn said, um, having a group of, of, of ambassadors there. In, I, there's a brilliant story when I got to interview Madden Albright for, for the book. And when she was ambassador to the UN, she had a group of, they called themselves the G7, because there's only seven women um, ambassadors um, uh, in the General Assembly at the time. And they shared cars and they did this and exactly they had all this information sharing. And and still to this day, that, that, um, that, that, um, that group still holds, not, not just as ambassadors, but when I was in New York, um, we were all invited with, from, from every country, uh, female uh, diplomats were, were invited. Um, role models, so important. Anne Anderson, the woman who that I mentioned, who rotated all the, the thing, she was my first, fem first ambassador. And I was just so in awe of her. And, and, and one story that I will tell which makes me even more on her, and I think most people will be. But I'm sure people have, you know, idols, whether you want to call them idols, whatever you want to call them, role model idols in their life. Um, and you look at them, and you, you know, you might read their biography, you know, Samantha Power or uh, Mary Robinson, and this, and you, and you read their their past and when they were in undergrad or when, and you're like, they do these amazing things. And you think, oh, of course they did these things. Like they're Mary Robinson, they're Samantha Pat, like, of course they did that. Um, I, and it just seems normal because you know where they're going to end up. Like, you know, the end of the, the story, like, you know, their ambassador, you know, their president. But Anne Anderson, she was, when she was a third sex, so it would have been in the seventies, she was posted to Geneva as a third sec, her first posting, and she asked for spousal pay for her husband. And Ireland's Department of Foreign Affairs were like, mm, no, <laughs> that's weird. And she said, why? They're like, because we do not give spousal pay to men. <laughs> and she she was like, but you give it to the wives. They're like, yeah. And she fought them on it. like let alone that they even fought her on it, like it still baffles. You think they were like, oh God, oops, and then just give it. They fought her on it for, for a year and through the courts and she won. And then men were given spousal pay. But that was, we need to remember, at her most junior level of, of uh, um, as a diplomat, for all she knew, or she knew, she could have been the bravery. I don't know if I would have had the bravery 
the bravery of her to do that, she could have thought, I, I will be blacklisted, like, she, for, you know, for all these different promotions. She didn't know she was going to go on to be the top ambassador and the top, one of the top diplomats in the Irish Foreign Ministry. So I, I'm hesitant to say be bold because I've also seen it backfire, but I'm, I've also seen so many examples of be bold and it works so well. At one point in time, someone's going to be the case study, someone's going to be bold and yeah, let's not look at our role models and think in their past. They did it because, of course, they did it with them. Um, you know, the bravery in which they showed so in their youth. I call myself sub elderly these days, but in their youth is, you know, phenomenal. But that's the point. Amazing. Um... That was really interesting from both of you, and I will take note of that advice for sure. <laughs> but um, uh, I got a couple more questions. It seems there's two left, and I think one can probably go to Evelyn and one to Cassid or mm -hmm. Jennifer, not Cassid. <laughs> but um, either like, but uh, yeah. So for Evelyn, Philippe asks, how can we potentially navigate? situation or diplomatic situations where the legal and cultural norms in the country just to expand upon what you're talking about undervalues women's rights and for jennifer to come back to the issue of feminist foreign policy christina asks well given that there's so many different understandings of what feminist foreign policy means how do you understand it yourself and what do you think the different approaches are to it so she lists a few such as sweden who emphasizes the importance of representation and the Centre for Feminist Foreign Policy, for instance, demands a more structural change in the direction of disarmament and demilitarisation. So I'll uh, maybe give the floor to Evelyn first. Back to you, because honestly, I couldn't understand. Could you repeat the question? No problem. Sorry. It's uh, just what Philippe or, or what you were talking about uh, regarding like countries with different legal and cultural norms. So Philippe asked, um, how can we navigate these diplomatic situations where the legal and cultural norms undermines women's rights from our own perspective? I mean, this is really, I mean, this is really a huge, uh, uh, I mean, it's, it's terribly difficult if I, if I had a, a a quick answer, I'd love to uh, to to give that to you. I mean, one is always sitting on a table, uh, going for dialogue. This is always important. Um, sometimes it's really very difficult, but coming for going for the dialogue, and then when sitting there on the table to. Uh, to to sit there in a table where you have the really the the, the the face of you, and this this is not men sitting there. I just make it right now bluntly. My my sister is a teacher, and there are parents, fathers with a, a background where they say they don't talk to a female teacher. They simply don't talk to her, um, and. She also, of course, would like to spit into the face of such a father huh? who is acting like this, but of course she doesn't do that, uh, but tries to find ways to say, okay, he has to talk to me. No point about that, but maybe I take a colleague, a male colleague sitting next to me, but I'm talking. And I think it's also concerning those cultures, those, I really call them, I don't want to say even cultures, I say. That's patriarchy, and I never ever want to uh, to 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 uh, um, to end up there where we say we respect it, that there are uh, systems where women are oppressed, where the child marriage is possible, where uh, really sort of this machism uh, uh, gets the overhand. So the goal is anyway to change there something, but on the other hand, it is important to sit there on the table as also uh, uh, 
female diplomats there. So not to go in and say, okay, there are always European Union from the European Union, then there is only the male diplomats negotiating. No, no, no. I admire very much uh, Angela Miaki when she was going sometimes uh, to to Saudi Arabia or to whatever, and there being just blunt as she is. So uh, uh, and not respecting and whatever, anything uh, 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 concerning the habits of uh, clothing or, uh, or, or so on. So I, I think it is important to be firm, to sit there on the table according to our uh, uh, principles. Uh, also always to bring in what's the core values and the fundamental rights of the international community are. I mean, when we're referring to that, we don't have to respect some uh, whatever uh, macho habitudes when we have the UN Carter. So we can rely on some principles, but always to go for the dialogue and there to be gently, to be friendly, but to be very strict on the content. So never give up the dialogue, but be uh, quite outspoken because that's what I learned uh, with my sometimes very harsh conflicts with the Polish government, um, you are not appreciated more if you say too many times nicely, yes, you're right. You have to be very strict and very clear and very outspoken on what is okay and what is not okay, but to go for the dialogue. And so I, I'll, well, uh, I'll answer the next question. I, I saw another question coming through, but unfortunately, I might have to go just because I think I got a phone call regarding a COVID test. I don't have COVID. I have the vaccine, by the way, but it's for flying. Um, so even though I have the vaccine, I still have to get a COVID test, but the results. No, so I'm going to go after wrong. this. Um, I think we've only got one question after anyway, so oh, don't worry about it. <laughs> um, but just, just, just on... Just to briefly say on 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 that that, that latter question, um, so Jane Marriott, uh, who was the UK ambassador to Yemen and Iran, two different postings, um, she uh, wrote a chapter, and I approached her and I said, I would like you to write a chapter of what it's like to be a female ambassador to a country that doesn't have gender equality you know, at its core, let's say. Um, and she came back and she actually gave a lot of positives saying, you know, as a female ambassador, she could gather a lot of information that um, her male counterparts um, could not. And there was a, you know, she spoke of allyship with other ambassadors. There, there's quite a number of, of, of stories about that, but, um, I think, yeah, and, if, and and regarding negotiations, I would I would certainly agree with Ev Evelyn um, as well. But I would just mention the Saudi example only because uh, my co-author in 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 one of the chapters and my and actually my closest friend in life is Saudi, and she's working in uh, um, she lives and works in Riyadh, and her mother's actually in doesn't have power, but her mother is were in the parliament in um, Saudi and is also cancer the research scientist, like I don't know how she does it all. But she, the, um, she was the first woman, my uh, friend was the first woman to get, a Saudi woman to get a PhD here from Oxford in genetics and, and but she still can't vote in her country, which, you know, she's like, can't wrap my head around that one. Um, however, it's, when we're negotiating with these countries um, or there's a negotiation with them, yes, you want to be sometimes like, how dare you say that? How dare you say that? But I am such a pragmatist in, in and this is just my personal view in, in everything I do, that if I'm like, okay, if my outcome is X, that is, I want increased you know, rights or, or this, I will act in a certain way in order to achieve that objective, even if it really isn't in line with how I'm actually internally feeling. So although you may have like this, this sea of men, for, like using Saudi as an example, sea of men in, in front of you negotiating, you know, behind the scenes are women who actively, you know, 
want you to be there and want you to work and promote for 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 their rights and and, and things so it's a hard balance you know you don't want to be like yes of course you're right like this is great and then you don't want to be too tough so yeah it's a kind of read the room um situation and then finally regarding the feminist foreign policy so i think that is that that question is and this is obviously not meant to in, in, in any way insult the person who asked the question not so much a question in in so far as so I'm on the advisory board for the Council of the Far so Christina Lunds, who runs the Centre for Feminist Foreign Policy, used to be my student. Um, but Margaret Wallstrom is also on the advisory board. So we all shared the same, you know, we all everyone on the advisory board has different views on, on like we all share that it's like it's the uh, you know decolonization disarmament all, all, all this but you know we might not define it in the exact same way but i think it's testament to the fact that if you just go on the cffp you know website and they were you know awarded forbes 30 under 30 you know for their work and their advocacy um you will see that there's a diverse people on like the 10 of us on the advisory council and we don't all agree on this exact definition of a feminist foreign policy and I think that's a good thing you know I don't think there should just be this label again if you have this, this concrete label it will stick on that it's like this is the policy and we're imposing it on on this you know we all have a different version of it based on our own like nation state or historical context or like social views so the Swedish, so Sweden versus CFFP doesn't really stand in, in, in the respect that Margaret Wilson is CFFP as well. If that makes sense. Yeah, I think that's a great answer. Um, so if you need to go, then feel free yeah, to- Yeah, just in case it's a test because no, I'm so paranoid about this. Sorry, I, I also have to, to, to leave right now. That's so okay, I was just going to say wrapping it up anyway. So um, thank you so much. Hard path. And thank you so much. You've given such amazing insights and I'm super happy to have met you both even virtually. And I can assure you all our participants have, even though we can't see them, definitely probably had a great time. So, and it's been a really interactive session and I've really enjoyed your answers. So thank you thank so you much. Thank you for having us. Thank, thank you. you. Yes, thank thanks. you. And have a nice bye, weekend. Everyone. All the best. Bye. bye, bye. And bye. Bye-bye. Just to those listening, any attendees, we are starting again tomorrow with at 10.30 with a tech panel on tech diplomacy by the European Horizon Society. So do join if you feel like it. Thank you.